I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the interview room with Chris McDonough. Uh, we're grateful that you're here, and uh, we've got a just an amazing program uh, on tap for you this evening. Uh, we've got uh, Billy uh, Little down there, uh, my my buddy, uh, and uh, over on the left hand side, you've got uh, we've got Brian Newmeister. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for having me. Outstanding. And Billy, how are you doing, buddy? Doing fantastic, Chris. Thanks. How are you? Outstanding. Thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to have you two great guys here this evening. I'll tell you, uh, I'm trying to see if our chat's lit up here. Dylan, is our chat going here? I'm not seeing anything rolling on my side, but that's probably just my uh, technical sure. Oh, there he goes. He just said, not sure why the, why the chat's not going, but that's okay. I can't see it, but uh, we'll figure it out here in a couple. Uh, so anyway, uh, what are we talking about tonight, Billy? We're talking about Maya. And I want to thank everybody uh, in San Diego County and quite frankly, around the world uh, who has been working most diligently for this wonderful family and, and this uh, just wonderful human being. Um, again, she's a mother, three children, okay, vanished. And uh, Billy uh, down here has been working with the family, just an absolute bulldog. Uh, as you can tell, he's a, he's a Marine uh, and, uh, you know, be, to the swords behind him. Uh, I love I love this devil dog. He's a great, great man. He's not only a great man, he's, he's an incredible attorney and just an amazing mind. Uh, also tonight, you know, uh, I want to just up front thank everybody uh, who works with us on in our mods? And uh, I we can't do this show without you. We're we're so grateful that you help us, uh, that you support us. Uh, I want to tell you right now that I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, sitting in the back of my Airstream at a KOA RV park. I mean, if you can believe modern technology, <laughs> right? And I'm headed to go do a couple of things. Uh, for some other folks, uh, and I think you know, uh, those of you who follow this channel know where I'm headed. And uh, Billy, I think, is going to be right there with me. We were talking earlier today after uh, Maya situation. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're probably going to dive into a couple things together. Uh, I just love this guy. He's, he's just, his tenacity is amazing. So I want to introduce our first guest here tonight. And uh, I, I, I think the easiest way to do this is, Dylan, Let's tee up, uh, because quite frankly, I, I'm looking at Brian's uh, pedigree here, and I got to tell you, uh, guys and gals, you're going to be amazed by this man here this evening and his company and just everything that these guys do. Uh, he's working probably on average about 200 cases a year for both the defense prosecution, for private. Uh, so if you need anything uh, at the end of this show and you happen to be no, if you happen to know somebody that's in need, uh, go over to usaforensics.com. We're going to put their uh, you know company website in the in the below uh, you know description of tonight after tonight's program. But I'm I'm here to tell you th this guy's amazing. He's got uh, how many? Thirty nine Emmys. Yes. Thirty nine Emmys, Brian, mm -hmm. approximately. 
39 <laughs> Emmys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Holy well, cow. You know, I, w I was lucky to get a popsicle in, 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 uh, you know, elementary school. And, and here you are, you know, just as humble as can be. I absolutely cannot wait. So the easiest way to introduce Brian tonight is Dylan, let's play a little bit of uh, cyber, cyber snooping. Uh, that we've got. And let's throw up that little video about Brian and his pedigree and his company. Go ahead, hit hit us with that uh, video, Dill. Well, Brian Neumeister is world renowned with what he does in computer forensics. He's the kind of guy that clarifies your digital fingerprint. So he can work on the highest of profile cases, but you've definitely heard of and seen in the news, down to the simplest of divorces that you'll never hear about. To the people that know him, he's like Merlin the Magician, you know, a guy who can do things that other people just can't do. After I graduated from Cal State, I became a news reporter for uh, NBC. I found out I didn't like to wear suits, so I uh, became a cameraman, which is uh, something I was always infatuated with, a camera. In the 80s, when I was doing video from the helicopter, I was also very into doing music. And often I'd get calls from police departments or whatever, hey, can you clean up this audio? And I'm like, I'll give it a try. In the 90s, there was so many surveillance cameras, so many people with recorders, the growing army of cell phones, that it was a natural place to take what I could do and expand it. USA Forensic does audio, video, cell phones, cell towers, and computers on a seven day a week basis. People see stuff on TV and they see CSI solving a crime in 58 minutes. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of behind the scenes grinding. Video cameras, when surveillance cameras are recording, they only record areas of the video that have movement. These areas that are in red are stored in what's called the frame buffer. So very often, if there's a lot of movement, it will take longer to record one frame than if there's very little movement. You know, whether it's a noise that needs to be eliminated from a, a video so you can actually hear what people are saying. We had one case that involved a recording where you really couldn't hear and it seemed like they may have done something to erase one of the tapes, but he was able to bring it out. This is limited to 5,000 hertz, so I'm gonna limit it to 5,000 hertz. I'm gonna create a 3D model Oh, the yeah. challenges are daunting. First of all, you have to have the chops to, to do this. Uh, you're going to spend thirty, sometimes fifty thousand dollars a month on equipment. To stay in this business, you've also got to understand how to meet the needs of the attorneys and law enforcement. So you have to uh, articulate quickly to attorneys, find out what they want, and be able to deliver on time. Okay, Brian. What I've got is I've got a cell phone that. Okay, so. Guys, this is that's just a little bit about our guest here tonight. And then, of course, Billy Little, who is very humble, in my opinion, is who has who has as deep a pedigree as, as Brian. Uh, and, you know, he has uh, represented some extremely uh, very high profile cases across the country. But here's where we're going tonight. Uh, Brian's Brian's here to talk about. Uh, some things that Billy asked him to take a look at uh, in relationship to uh, an audio tape that everybody is uh, becoming aware of here tonight. Uh, but we also have some additional information. So, uh, Billy, let's let's start off with you and I. Let's talk about what what have you got so far that uh, you want to talk to you know the general public about in terms of Maya's investigation. Something about a white comforter, right? Yeah, so um, it's been it's been a hundred days now since she went missing. Um, so it's an anniversary we didn't want to get to, but we're here. So let's. I just want to recap a few of the things that have happened just in the past week. Uh, one thing is there's a white comforter that has been confirmed missing from the bedroom, the bedroom where the door was locked, uh, where she had been hiding. Uh, where the holes were in the wall, the holes in the door. So that's where the white comforter was, and now it's gone. Uh, okay. We have also attempted to uh, confirm or refute Larry's claims that he went to Solana Beach. So we've requested video from the city of Solana Beach. Um, there has been a request for uh, the calls for service from Chula Vista, and they have asked for an extension for uh, because they say this case is complex. And they, so that 
probably be, will be delayed until about April 30th. Uh, on this past Monday, there was a Dr. Phil show on this case, which brought uh, additional national media attention for it. So that was, that was a great thing. Uh, the community searches are continuing. Mary Chris and the family are leading those searches. Uh, we do want to send our well wishes to JR, one of the brothers of Maya. He was involved in a search yesterday and fell down a ravine and dislocated his shoulder, wound up in a, an emergency room last night. Uh, he's doing well, uh, but he's in pain and we not only wish him well, but we want everyone to remember to that it's dangerous out there. So be safe if you're assisting with these searches, but please, we appreciate the help and please continue to search. Uh, there should be a celebration of Maya's birthday. Her birthday is May the 1st, and there's going to be a celebration for her at the Chula Vista City Hall on May 4th at 5 p.m. in Chula Vista, uh, California. Yeah, so you we want people just, to put the word out. You want people to put the word out on that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We want a nice uh, showing. It'll be 5 p.m. May 4th, a uh, celebration of her life. Um uh, and possibly some calls for action if nothing has happened by then. So okay. we also discovered um, Larry's prior gang involvement and a possible stabbing, still trying to nail that down 100%, but about 95% there. And okay. discovered that there are witnesses, we do have witnesses that acknowledge the smell of bleach at Larry and Maya's home on Sunday, January 10th, just uh, two days or so after she goes missing. And finally, and this is, I think that what the, tonight's show is about is we got the original clean gunshot audio and video, and it has been posted by CBS news on the internet. Uh, that's been, they did that, that was authorized. And this is not the recording of a recording of a recording that everybody heard initially where some background noises were heard. This is the actual audio from that night. And people on the internet are saying, well, I hear a child yelling, I hear somebody yelping. So there's a lot of speculation and that's the kind of stuff that I, I'm hoping that Brian can help us clear up through his work. Yeah, so Billy, you have been uh, an absolute diligent um, uh, steward of of Maya's case here, and I commend you. And and though uh, folks, if you're just joining with us tonight, uh, we have Brian Newmeister here and Billy Little, who uh, are, are just incredible, uh, not only human beings but uh, investigators in their own right. Uh, doing what they do. And Brian is one of the uh, actually probably international renowned uh, forensics guy in the game. And uh, so what I want to do is, uh, Brian, you sent over a chart. Uh, and what I want to do is put this chart up for a second. <laughs> and, and folks, please forgive us tonight. I'm having a, a little technical difficulty in seeing your chat. So uh, we're going to try to figure that out. But in the interim, if if uh, everybody's saying something, I just want to tell you, I thank you. We, we love you. We care about you. I just can't see your messaging uh, right now. So we'll, we'll try to figure that out as we go along. But that said, so Brian, uh, tell us what we're looking at here. What do we got going? Okay. Actually, um, for us, we're, we're kind of in not the speculative side, we're in the data side. And what we try to do is provide you with data that's reliable. Uh, and that in, in order to do that, what I had originally uh, done, as I said to Billy, uh, those particular four charts, uh, and, and what those are is, it's basically uh, describing the type of waveforms or the type of audio we received, as opposed to what we need. And Chris, you know, as a, as a former uh, law enforcement or detective, that you need to have a chain of custody to the original. So you can't have a picture of a gun, you need the gun. Uh, in this case, we needed to get the original audio and what we had was a copy of a copy. So what I did is I threw it up on a, a spectrograph and a sonograph and my business involves a lot of math. So this comes down to, uh, for example, on the upper left-hand corner, <clears throat> I could tell that the audio tops out at four kilohertz, which to me means that the recording was at 8K, 
but the, re the recording I received was in a different format. What that means, it's, it's going to degrade the quality. So, uh, so when I went through it, I, I looked at it from 3D spectral editing, from sonograph to, to different ways to understand what I'm dealing with. Because even when you get the original like this, what you have to do is paint away the background sound in order to, to arrive at what you want. Uh, so this was a request basically showing what was wrong with that particular audio. If you look on the bottom of the lower right, the green uh, 3D chart right there, you can see there's a bunch of uh, like kind of like a wave of green on the bottom, uh, the bottom uh, like one fifth. That's all just extraneous noise that uh, would not be on the original. That's uh, called aliasing and a few other different uh, uh, terms we use. But... I was sent the uh, newer audio, and I haven't yet uh, been able to uh, get to it. I just received, I think, on Saturday or Friday, and we're always backed up by at least two weeks. So the plan will be to go through and clarify what is pertinent and what is not by literally – you can't just run it through a program. You're going to have to manually um, uh, literally paint out using a 3D spectrograph the – the parts of audio you don't want, whether it be, for example, sirens in a typical situation. And I don't know, typical, here's an example. I, I just did a case where uh, somebody was playing a piano, but the people were, that I wanted were on the other side of the piano talking. So I had to remove each piano note uh, using a 3D spectral editor. Then I was able to bring out what they were saying. So I have to determine what I need to remove to be able to, to, to get it. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely makes sense. And so, when you when you got this uh, audio, uh, it was a copy of of the original. Is that correct? I, I don't know because I haven't looked at the original yet. It, I could tell by looking at there's a, a mathematical theorem we use called the Nyquist theorem, and I could tell by okay. doing the math that this was not an original. Uh, math is again a large part of what we do. So the one thing that always concerns me about a dub of a dub, and this is really, really critical to evidence, is um, that audio pareidolia, which means people hearing things in white noise when there's a lot of background noise, um, that background yep. noise needs to be isolated. If I have a very you know, bad recording of a wire where somebody had a wire in their pocket or whatever, um, I need to clean it up because I can have five or ten attorneys in a room I, I play it back to them, and I have them write down what they hear, and everybody hears what they want to hear, and that's really important to understand. If you think you see a face in a cloud, that's pareidolia. It's your mind trying to make a pattern out of something that is random. So my job is to clean it up enough to eliminate as much of that as possible. Um, and I think it's you know your listeners, it, it's it, it's you look at a case like Whitey Bulger. Those are solved by people like the people listening to this program. Uh, people that are interested in solving it, the police department doesn't have the resources very often. Of course, we never want to get in the way of police work, but it's so helpful to have people out there looking into a case. Yeah, no, this, and you're on the right channel, buddy. I mean, the people that are following this channel are really smart. That's and uh, they have really, yeah, they've weighed in. Uh, and I, you know, we remind, uh, I remind, you know, PDs all the time that, look, you know, it's not the agency that solves the crime. It's the citizens. And you, we just we're just lucky enough to assemble all the pieces and then send them to people like you to make sense of it. And, and then we tell this, you know, hand it to the D.A. and they tell the story in, in, in the courtroom. Right. So you heard uh, when when you take a look at this chart. Well, let me ask Billy. Billy, what are your thoughts on? on what Brian said so far. Any Anything come yeah, to your if, mind? Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. So uh, sure, with, sure. The, with the one that has not yet been analyzed by Brian, uh, there's what people will do and what I do, right, is you just crank it all the way up and you try to hear what you can hear in the background. And there's always this distortion, this kind of shh sound in the background. Are you able to take that away and Yes. Get something that you, if, if somebody said something, would you be able to, to pick that up, like you said, with the piano? And how do you do that? Well, it depends. We use, <clears throat> I've got probably, we've got about 400 programs between both labs of different kinds of, it can be anywhere from, uh, you know, from cell phone uh, hacking or 
exploratory stuff to, uh, you know, video, audio, uh, in surveillance, photographic. It's all for, for clarifying and validating. So one of the first things we would do on that is we, we basically analyze what is wrong with it. In other words, what, what is the noise pattern? Then we'd sample that noise pattern and do what's called phase cancellation, where we drive it into each other to get rid of it. So I might be asked to say, I might get a call like, uh, there's somebody on the cell phone, we want to hear what's going on across the street from the caller. Because very often you can hear the people talking across the street. So you've got to isolate just the background and take out the person talking. So it's a matter of selective, uh, what do you want to hear in this particular piece? And um, then there's some programs like Isotope and a few others that, that are starting point, but it really comes down, I've been doing this for 40 years now, uh, it, it really comes down to hand painting out what you don't want. So very often, uh, like I say, we work, if you get a Department of Defense, okay, we have a contract with the DOD, uh, or with different law enforcement agencies, or even with the Innocence Project for you know private cases, it doesn't matter. It's all the same because data is data, and it doesn't take a side. Our process is to it's a process of elimination. It's okay. We need to remove the sirens. We need to remove or isolate the gunshots. We need to remove somebody's voice. We need to keep this voice. Remove the other one. So <clears throat> it's basically stripping it down and, and compartmentalizing different parts of the audio. <laughs> And if I could ask a follow-up, Chris. Um, so, like Chris said, that we get hundreds of tips and calls in and people that are extremely helpful, extremely interested, and very smart, like <laughs> very smart people out there helping. Uh, but some of the comments that come in are, yeah, well, you know, I have, I can download an app that will clean this up. I can do this myself. What What is the difference between what you do and what, the people on the internet are saying, well, we can clean this up. We, what's the difference between that and what you do? That's a great question. I, first of all, you know, I, I think a lot of it is experience because there's a lot of great tools. You can download a program like Audigy for free and, and actually clean it up quite a bit. It's just the degree that you can get uh, of clarity. Um, we got to, we have to look at things from a, from, what we call Daubert standards, admissibility standards. So we have to have a chain of custody for everything we do. Every move we make with the audio has to be logged and, and, and basically ready for another expert to look at it or for the courts to say, yes, this is valid, what you did. Um, and it also depends if law enforcement has a, 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 you know, a particular, or somebody has a particular shot of a, a still frame, whatever they want brought out of a, a shooting and they want the picture on right away. The amount of time that's going to be spent on that's going to be less than um, you know than you would do for a court case because you need it on the television right away. But for people downloading <clears throat> audio, excuse me, audio programs at home and doing this, um, I say go for it. Learn a little bit about it. Learn a little bit. There's lots of tutorials on audio engineering or just audio clarification with the app you may download. It never hurts because, like I say, with with Whitey Bulger, that was solved by people just ha having their eyes open. And you, your, your people are such a valuable resource. Um, you know, it's, it, it can be done, whether it's admissible in court becomes a different, a different reality. Uh, and I think a lot of it is just the depth of the equipment we use. We use a lot of very large processors and a lot of large systems, and we can really get down into every sample, every individual, every little, little artifact. And, and that, that makes a difference. And, and one more follow-up, if I could, Chris. Yeah, of course. Uh, so go. Go. I, I know, Brian, that you've heard a lot of, analyzed a lot of uh, sounds that appear to be gunshots from probably shot spotters in the city, mm -hmm. um, various surveillance cameras, <clears throat> recording devices, uh, all of those. And in this case, um, I've now provided you with the type of equipment that was used to record this. How important is it that you know what equipment is used to record the sounds? Very equipment. It's very important because um, very often if you have a gunshot, a, a shootout where there's maybe a hundred shots, uh, you know, in in a house, uh, for example, a gang shootout, there's different calibers of weapons. One of the things you have to realize on a lot of surveillance systems, they're going to record at a very low sample rate, usually eight kilohertz, which is fine for human voices with, that are close to a microphone. 
when you start getting into a room where there's a lot of ambience, you have to know the ambience in the room, how, how much echo there is. For example, if I'm doing a CI wire that might have been inside a, a very ambient room, like a, a, you know, a, a jail or something that's very lively, like a gymnasium, I have to be able to remove all the echo to, to, to get down to the voices. So having the tools to do that. But on a home video recorder, you've got an automatic gain control circuit, which tends to bring up certain sounds, and the minute it reaches a certain level, it clamps it down, and then it recovers. So by knowing the equipment, we can predict uh, the type of uh, response we expect to get from a gunshot, because a gunshot is going to probably beat the AGC circuit. It's too fast a peak to, uh, to defeat the AGC. The question is, that's going to bring down, after a while, the overall level, which makes the conversation harder to hear. So, again, what we start doing then is, is cutting out white noise, cutting out pink noise, anything that isn't human voice or anything that doesn't seem to be something that would benefit the overall picture of the case. And knowing, knowing the equipment that was used to record in this case, mm -hmm. how optimistic are you that you're going to be able to get something that's usable, definitive. I know you don't want to speculate about what it is, but just knowing the equipment that it was recorded on, are you optimistic that we're going to get something that's usable out of this? Um, <clears throat> yes, but the, the question is, what is it? I mean, I don't know if it's helpful or if it's usable, yes. Um, the, the, the copy I originally received, which was a copy of the copy, uh, I could already work quite a bit with that. The, the question is, comes down to, I haven't hand painted stuff out yet. So to pull conversation out is going to take a little bit of work. Um, and it's going to depend again on how the automatic game control was impacted by the gunshots. So it is a matter of literally painstakingly tearing apart the audio into, you know, there's 48,000 uh, samples per second or whatever, depending on the sample rate of the machine. I need to be able to pull that apart, clean up the samples, you know, look for what would be human voice traits. Uh, and then, um, you know, very often we'd be, we'd have to re try to uh, predict what type of gun was used. Now, very often that's pretty easy by the cases that are recovered. If no cases are recovered, then very often you have to recreate gunshots in a shoot room. And if, if the gun is, for example, a 357, in a small enclosed area, it's not going to matter if there's a short barrel or a long barrel because it's going to be so overpoweringly loud that uh, you know <clears throat> you'd want to test a number of different weapons to see if that caliber would overmodulate a certain amount in the recording that was presented. So uh, I'm trying to say this without getting all math and nerdy, but basically uh, it's basically <laughs> measurements of sound and what's called luffs or decibel pressure versus um, what the machine can handle and the distance from the machine, the acoustics of the room, uh, a few other anomalies that, that I don't know, the, I don't know the layout where the mic was pointed and that sort of thing. So, but we do get a lot of shootings and sometimes from blocks away. So you got to take into consideration how, how fast sound would be traveling uh, that time of night. It does vary by temperature. It does vary by what it's going through. Uh, very little, but some. But if you have multiple gunshots and you're trying to figure out who's shooting when, you have to just figure out what type of caliber you're dealing with. Uh, you know, you might be dealing with a situation where you've got an AK-47 and a, a handgun. Well, that's fairly easy. When you get two handguns, it gets a little more difficult. So you have to measure uh, lofts, uh, frequencies. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can measure with, uh, with gunshots. But that actually was, you led me right into my next question, which is, I know that you both have heard uh, gun fights, recordings of gun fights, right? Mm -hmm. Like multiple oh, yeah. guns. <clears throat> and so you can kind of hear the, the deeper sounds and then the higher pitch sounds and then the ones that are further away. And so it's a little easier to tell the different calibers and different types of handguns, especially if you have some additional information. So does it make it more difficult in this case because we're hearing only one, what we believe to be gunshot? Yeah, it does. I had a case where over 100 shots were fired inside a, inside a house uh, in, a, in, a, in about 20 seconds, a lot of people shooting. So in that case, you have to slow it down, take it uh, apart bit by bit. And what we did is we built a shoot house with some uh, 
uh, some real experts, uh, you know, uh, really well-known gun people. And we re and we knew the type of calibers, but we were trying to figure out who shot when. So we recreated a, a shoot house basically by, you know, uh, the size of the room, the acoustics. We did a lot of acoustic mapping. We had a number of microphones. And we did a bunch of tests to figure out which weapon was firing when, and it turned out quite well. Um, because you have to judge it by... Uh, a, what's on the scopes, and B, what the microphone that recorded it can handle. Uh, a lot of times they're not built for that kind of decibel pressure. So they're going to clip, So, uh, which means cut out. So <clears throat> all this has to be taken into account, and um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. It depends on how good the recording is. But very often, distance actually helps. Okay, so I can ask one really more, Chris. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, go. <laughs> this go is your show, you know, man. Not... Yeah. Hey, don't worry. It's this is about Maya. You ask all the questions you want, Billy, and you keep going. So, you go, uh, Billy. Good. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'll shut up. I talk you too much me. like every other lawyer. Uh, so, <laughs> no. Nope. The question is: so there are witnesses who say that when this was the original was turned into the police uh, back in January, that they spontaneously said. Oh, that's absolutely gunfire, and it sounds like a 357. Um, do you think that type of comment is appropriate or inappropriate, or do you think it was just something that just almost an excited utterance came out? Um, do you have um, any comments on that? I, I don't speculate. I mean, to us, we have to narrow it down to data uh, because very often uh, we, we deal with, I've done over 2 million gunshots for the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, um, in the last 40 years, a lot of it um, very heavy uh, military automatic weapons and <clears throat> you know, Gatling guns, that sort of stuff for helicopters. Um, every weapon's going to record differently depending on how it was recorded. Uh, for certain well-known movies, the uh, microphone arrays we used for uh, for recording the gun shot, the guns and the guns going, the bullets going by, because we do live fire. Uh, we'll have a, a whole microphone array, but we have to set it up to match the kind of area they're going to be shooting in. If they're going to be shooting in a house, it has to be recorded like that. If they're going to be shooting on the outside, very different. Uh, depending on the speed of the bullet, it's going to, it's going to record differently as it passes by the mics. Uh, with a gunshot inside a house, first of all, you've got the extra boominess of the room. Um, you've got a very low quality recorder recording it. So... I, I wouldn't jump to any conclusions without doing some kind of scientific, uh, you know, litmus. In other words, a database of gunshots. Uh, let's just first. Uh, my my thought on this is, you know, let's clean up the gunshots as best we can. Let's clean up any dialogue we can get because dialogue is going to be key. Uh, any dialogue that might be there would be very very helpful. So, um, yep. you know, there's there's so many other things. I, I mean. I don't know, uh, you know, again, I'm not involved in law enforcement on this case, so I don't know if they used a, you know, a shot tracker or what they use. I don't know. I don't know where the investigation is. Like, I don't get involved in a case unless I'm asked to be involved, you know, and so um, I'm sure that they, you know, depending on resources, are spending as much time as they can. The, the one thing is that people have got to understand that law enforcement is, is, is grossly understaffed uh, and grossly over taxed. So um, they don't have the latest equipment because they don't have the budgets to constantly upgrade. And literally every three days we're upgrading. You know, it's not unusual us to spend an awful lot of money every month on the latest, greatest hardware for each lab. Uh, so, you know, we help out whenever they come into something weird that they would like some help on. We'll help them out. Um, but again, um, very often you get gun experts out there that are have worked a lot with guns and um, are very helpful. Uh, you know, we work with SEAL teams, all kinds of stuff in recreating these deals. So um, it, it, I hate to speculate. So I, I would just wait to let the data play out. So so let me ask one final question, I promise, Chris. Sure. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> famous last word. Uh, so yeah. the... They people talk about the Doppler effect, you know, that car racing going by, you know, that kind of thing. It's the same with with bullets outside, right? When rounds come out and they go away and forward. In a case, will you be able to tell whether the shot was inside a home or outside? 
Um, that's a great question. That is a very good question. Um, one of the things that, that we do when we do like an outside shooting, and the majority of shootings are actually outside, is we look for the reflect, reflective properties of the recording. So what buildings did the sounds uh, bounce off of? In other words, if you're in a downtown area and there's a gunshot fired, there's going to be acoustic energy that reflects off of different surfaces, buildings and stuff. So normally we'd, we'd go out to an area and we'd recreate it, not using a gunshot. We'd use a uh, something that generates a sound that's very inoffensive, but it measures the acoustical distances so that we can, from a manorial area, triangulate a rough area that we think a shot came from. Uh, just by the acoustics. Uh, so we'll keep moving around to try to get the right acoustical signature. Uh, when you have, you're not going to have a Doppler effect on a situation like this because it's not passing by. You're not having uh, a continuous sound. It has to be a continuous sound that, that, uh, that makes the change, like a car going by. Bullets are just, you know, one snap. So you're not going to have really that unless somebody's driving by and, you know, shooting an automatic weapon. So Doppler doesn't come into to play here what comes into play is how good is the mic how good is the uh, automatic gain control how's the limiter set on the dvr system that is going to be what is primarily technically the challenge as far as uh as far as the location of the shooting the the obvious things you would do would um uh, you know for if i was in the case you'd go into the room where the shooting was expected and you'd be recording from the same system that recorded, and you could use some test instruments that we use to generate would be similar impact to a gunshot, similar decibel levels, to see what the acoustics are that, that the system picked up. Uh, if it's an outside um, gunshot, it's much easier to tell. There's going to be a lot more of an open sound than it will be, uh, than it's closed. And I really haven't looked at that yet because I, I just know we just did get the original, so yes. I'll be able to tell it was inside or outside. Wow, that's fantastic. That's a big deal, really, and especially well, in this case. It comes down to acoustic properties. Uh, acoustic properties are really, uh, really helpful in um, in determining what went on. You can even tell very often it, what rooms in a house somebody was as they're moving by the changes in acoustical properties. But in order to do that, you have to record with the same system in the same area and recreate it to, to make sure that the acoustics in the room that you're in are uh, matching up to what was recorded at a certain decibel level. So uh, it's, it's you know, basically the physics of the sound bouncing around in a room and then uh, you know, looking at how the particular recorder handled that uh, those sound waves. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> no Thanks, problem, Ryan. I, I, they, No, this is fascinating. I, uh, you guys are amazing and, you know, um, uh, again, you know, I, I want to remind everybody here tonight, uh, we've got uh, Brian Niemeyer and, uh, uh, and Billy Jr., Billy uh, Little uh, here, and I've been having technical difficulties. So I've been going, I've, I've been sitting in the background, you know, like robot land over here. I feel like I'm part of the Jetsons. And, uh, you know, because for some reason, it always happens, right? You get a technical difficulty when you when you need to talk talk about some serious stuff. So um, your, your conversation is fascinating. And guys and gals, if, if you have not uh, had an opportunity uh, to go check out USA Forensics, please do that. Get over oh, there at... Uh, go we're, ahead. Actually US, yeah, we're actually USA Forensic. USA Forensics is a different company. Forensic. They do... Okay. Yeah, we're USA Forensic. F-O-R-E-N-S-I-C. My, my apologies, Brian. I, my, it happens my all the time. So, uh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the gunfire uh, in the Maya Maletti clash. And uh, I think, you know, Billy's brought uh, one of the best in the world to the play here. And so with that, I want to play the most recent uh, release. Uh, Dylan, if you can tee that up. Uh, let's see here. Let me make sure he can hear me. All right, I'm, he's having a little difficulty hearing me right now. So while he's getting that ready, um, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what you mentioned a little bit ago, uh, Brian, about ShotSpotter and uh, Billy, you mentioned it uh, as well. 
that uh, you know a lot of folks don't know what those technologies are and uh, just for the a high level uh, Reader's <clears throat> Digest version, um, there's a company called ShotSpotter and it was actually created years ago uh, for the military in the DOD side. And what, what it is, it's a it's acoustic uh, identifying uh, type of system. And what happens is uh, art, uh, AI or artificial intelligence uh, picks up the, the audio sound and they were originally attached to turrets uh, in military vehicles. So uh, you can imagine being in a combat situation where you have gunfire coming from the rear and all of a sudden this technology picks up that sound and turns the, uh, you know, the Gatling gun or whatever it is to that point of contact. Well, that technology was dummy down uh, and it's in a lot of cities across the United States. And, and what it is is basically microphones all over, you know, uh, various geographic regions, and it picks up gunfire, uh, or at least what sounds like gunfire. And that gunfire is then sent to what they call a real-time crime center or an RTCC or a fusion center. Uh, there are analysts there who immediately pick that information up, and then they can push that out to the field to the um, responding officers mobile, you know, they call them MDTs. Uh, and so the officers now can have real-time uh, capability as they're driving up on this. Uh, Brian, what what else can you tell uh, the audience about that technology as a whole, or or where technology is going while Dylan's getting ready to tee up this other uh, uh, video that was recently uh, put out about the shots? Well, I, I think uh, you pretty much covered it there. But one of the main things about Shot Spotter is triangulation because you need to have a number of different mics or different areas picking it up in order to triangulate a sound. You need three, an axis of at least three to get it into a geographical area. The other thing that's become a lot of problems in a lot of the bigger cities is fireworks. Uh, there's so many people setting off year round now fireworks that it, it does become a distraction because you have limited manpower, limited resources, and you keep, you kind of now have to wait for a 911 call to come in and then you're going to kind of, if it's an E911, that's going to triangulate it. If that matches your shot spotter, you've got a, a better shot at kind of a, a geographical area. But by the time that comes in, people may have left the geographical area. You don't know. But it's a valuable resource uh, to have because it, it narrows an area down. And it's particularly helpful if a, if a 911 call comes in because 911 is also triangulated by what's called enhanced 911 where it's yep. just using one cell tower, it uses multiple cell towers, just in case somebody's calling for, for example, a car accident, it can triangulate, uh, whereas with one cell tower, you can't do that. Uh, one shot spotter is not gonna help. You need a lot of different mics to, to make it work, a lot of different areas. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's also amazing. Cities like uh, New York and London have so much uh, coverage with uh, cameras, uh, so does Hong Kong, that, uh, you know, it's a different world that we live in now. Artificial intelligence. I, I just did a case last Thursday that I couldn't have done uh, probably a month ago. It changes that fast. I would say we up, upgrade about every two days uh, because there's so many people working on algorithms for AI. So very often, for example, just getting into a lot cell phone, there might be a new way to get into it that uh, we may be able to get stuff we weren't a week ago that we can get now. So very often rerunning cases that have not yet gone to court just because the technology changes so quickly. And unfortunately, the courts don't really, they're not technology based, they're law based as Billy knows. And the technology is just blowing by the court system. And there's so few people they can explain this. I, I find it easy working with the Department of Defense because in a military court, very often you have engineers uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, in in the average court, you don't have people with an engineering background and trying to explain some of this stuff to a judge and jury is can be quite difficult because it is pretty technical and it's important to understand the basis of it. So it's it's a work in progress. You know, it's it's something, but uh, eventually facts hopefully triumph. So that's the way we want to go. I appreciate you unpacking that like that. That's, uh, you know, it's really interesting, right? Because I think the average citizen thinks that, you know, you're, you, they look at your technology behind you and they say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, this is amazing. But in reality, 
you're you're constantly evolving as oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah and people, the environment mm -hmm, go ahead you, you know people will it's funny we have a uh we have a saying around here that um people go like what software vision are you using and you tell them they go oh that's so two o'clock you know i mean that's <laughs> and, and so um you know it's it's when i'm talking to an engineering course I, you know I, or, or whatever i'll just say look this this is as of today if you have a different question ask me tomorrow because it'll be you know i might have different answers uh artificial intelligence takes two step forward and then a half step back to, and that's the way it, it is so but we run a lot of ai we we have banks of these things at, at the other place um and then um it, it comes down to computational horsepower and i guarantee you, all these big seven foot boxes will fit on a watch in 10 years it's just the way technology goes but then then the, the other big 10 you know seven foot boxes so um very often we can do stuff or, or get into or decrypt something a lot faster than you know other people can just because we have toys that can do that so that can be very important in a case where you have a missing person and you have to act fast we'll get a call yeah. very often can you use uh sources that we may not have to be able to locate something and also yeah you know it depends on how urgent it is you know but uh, uh or can we get into this in a hurry can we get into this yeah. system and as you know billy with with the legal world there's always the paperwork however if it's an emergency that takes a back seat to uh, yep. you know to a lot of things so it just depends on the case yep so let's uh Chris, are let's... you able to get the uh the audio Yep, or here not. it comes. Yep, here it comes. Dylan, uh, let's put it up. No video, just audio. Yep, just the audio. He's getting it up here. So that's, uh, you know, I, I'm going to weigh in here. You know, I've been in this industry since 1982. Okay. So I'm, I'm going on 39 years here. Okay. 25 years, 13 in homicide. I've worked hundreds of cases. If not, you know, I've contacted thousands of people. Those are eight gunshots. And now I know Brian's going to break it down at some point, and, I, and I'm not going to ask him to opine because he still has to put his hand up and testify. Okay. 
But I'm here to tell you, okay, if that is the house where Maya was last seen, okay, somebody needs to get take care of business here. Okay, uh, because, you know, we can let the courts argue whether or not, you know, it, the chain of custody is correct and the audio files. Okay. But at this point, you know, that is enough to stop a community and, and motivate a community to say, what in the world did I just hear? Okay. And so that's just my two cents on YouTube. It's my own opinion. Uh, it's nobody else's. Uh, but we have a mother who's missing there is, sounds to be, I'll tell you the most disturbing part for me on that in that particular video or, or audio tape is the pause after round six. There's a gap. Okay? Now we can speculate what that gap means. Okay. Uh, you know, if it's a revolver and it's a six shot, okay, well then that's a reload. Okay? I don't know. Okay? I'm not going to, you know, go out on a limb on that, but I'm here, I'm here to tell you there were six shots, gap, seven, eight. Dylan, let's play it again. And folks, if you're just joining us, we, we're going over the tape. So just the audio. There you go. And Channel 8 put this up in San Diego. Okay, let's stop. Chris, can I, can I comment real quick? Please. So the emotional impact of listening to that has not diminished for me. I've listened to it a hundred times because uh, I know what was going on on the other end of that weapon. Um, but I can tell you from a legal standpoint, I hate hearing that, but from a legal standpoint, it's... Um, any premeditation only requires time for reflection. That means that between those, that pause, that 30 second pause, that's more than enough time to reflect. Guess what I recorded, Billy? What's Just that? Without, e without even knowing what you were gonna say. That is 1.28 or 23.44 and 1.28 are the gaps okay between between the gunfire that's okay. first degree murder that's oh, premeditation pre it's premeditated yeah this is th this is a problem folks uh, if if you're watching us tonight uh, we're going on the record this is a problem this is a major problem here okay and you know 
I, I, I am praying that Chula Vista PD is all over this thing and the DA's office. Okay? And a lot of them are my friends down there and I have faith in them. Okay? You know, doing my time in San Diego County. So uh, they got to get motivated though. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got a circumstantial situation case, you know, put it together you know, move on it because, you know, we've got a lot of other mitigating factors on the outside edges of these things. Uh, and I think you, everybody on this, on this uh, broadcast tonight knows uh, what we're talking about. And we got a family who's suffering. Okay? We've got children and we've got, uh, you know, grandparents on both sides. And I, and I mentioned this, you know, on the last broadcast, there are a lot of people that are going to be impacted ultimately uh, in this particular, you know, situation. And, you know, God forbid if anything happens from this point forward. Uh, go ahead, Bill. And I, and I know that we've not been authorized to release the video portion of that. Um, but right. when you see the video and you know the houses and is no question in your mind where that shot came from, where those shots came from. Yeah. Well, that Billy, night, and I, like you, I've heard, I haven't heard as many gunshot recordings as you, Chris. I'll defer to you on that, but I've heard a number of them, and you too, Brian. Um, but I've heard enough. I've heard a lot. Uh, and those are gunshots. Well, Brian, not, only, not a question in my mind. So, not, again, not Brian, only. you're not in this part of the conversation. Okay. Um, but, uh, go. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Brian. Well, I just want to say those are those are I, I hadn't heard it that the newer tape and, and not only uh, the gunshots have, are very easy to um, uh, it'd be very easy to recreate the size of the room because the acoustical properties of the shot uh, I, I it, they seem to be an indoor uh, gunshot and this is without looking at it so I need to look at where where the gap between the houses and the air I haven't seen the geographical area. But because the the boxiness of it, and I don't hear an extended echo, uh, it would seem to be a, a, an indoor shot or indoor group of shots. And they, and again, this is just going off the cuff without looking at it. But because the the gunshots are very consistent uh, in the in the recu in the acoustic uh, portion, at least the first few gunshots, they would seem to be in an enclosed area. Now that could be a carport. I don't know. I haven't seen the area. We haven't done any tests. But there's definitely walls that's reflecting off of right away. So, um, you know, I'm not familiar with the crime scene again, I'm, and I haven't analyzed the newer recording. But uh, outdoor shots have a lot less consistency than indoor shots have. Yeah, and and here's always the problem, right? That the they're they're trying to weigh out, you know, well, well who's pulling the trigger? Okay. That that's always the the mystery box here, right? For for the investigators, but you know, at that point, you know, really, you've 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 got a whole other bunch of tools and additional evidence that you can weigh on, and we know what that is. You know, later on, there's some other things that take place at zero two thirty, zero three hundred, uh, those kind of things. And Billy, I don't know how comfortable you feel about revealing some of the stuff that you've uncovered, but uh, you and I have talked privately. Um, what what are your thoughts about unpacking some of that if you if you feel there's that that is necessary or not? There's based on the information that I've gathered, um, it's pretty clear that uh, the Uncle Ricky came over to help clean up and probably uh, Kathy as well, uh, and that comes goes on around two thirty. Uh, the cleanup starts and then continues for the next couple of days. Then that smell of bleach, then those dried bath mats, uh, then this mysterious trip to Solana Beach when his wife goes missing along with that he, after stalking his wife for a year and a half, all of a sudden is disinterested in where she is, has no idea, um, leaves his, mysteriously leaves his cell phone <coughs> home so he can't be tracked, disables the car tracking system uh, disables the home security system, uh, missing comforters. Um, I mean, there's just a mountain of evidence, uh, more than we could get into here in the next few minutes, for sure. Yep. And you went over to the house within a couple of days of her disappearance. And uh, yep. refresh, re refresh the audience what your observations were when you went into the home. 
Yeah, you walked in and I walked in on Monday. So on Sunday, the witnesses say there was still the smell of bleach. Remember that this took place Thursday night at 9.57 p.m. That, those were those shots. Um, and then the cleanup started at 2.30, um, probably earlier than that, but got assistance at around 2.30 a.m. And by the time I got there on Monday, it was the, all the windows in the house were open. The fans were on full blast. Um, and I walked in and it was clean. And, I, and I've seen, I was surprised at how clean it was because I expected to see uh, some blood spatter or something or fresh paint or something, smell of bleach, something like that. Uh, I expected to see that, especially because I knew that he was looking for gun cleaning equipment from somebody. When I asked him about GSR, gunshot residue on his hands, he said, oh yeah, yeah, I've been shooting the last few days. So there'll be gunshot residue on my hands. Um, it just well, Billy, all falls into place. Billy, What's that, Brian? The, yeah, one of the things that uh, Chris, I'm sure, knows is one of the things that people forget to do is GSR gets on the ceiling when you're having a shootout, for example, in a house. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing GSR swabs, gunshot residue swabs, looking for nitrates and for powder elements, uh, the ceiling is always a good place to go because people always forget to clean the ceilings. I think I should so, not say that. that. Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah. uh, if you guys just heard that, go get a search warrant. <laughs> get it done. Get it done. And can if, I, if can it I has mention something else, Chris, that you guys that you'll know for yeah. sure? Go, which Billy. Is, so I've seen them clean up where the you can't spot the blood, not using luminol or blue star on the carpet. Yep. I've seen them. Don't clean tip well his hat. To, Don't tip his hat though. Don't tip his hat. I mean, I if okay. I think I'll I know where you're going. You, I you think know I know where, where you're going. going here. Yeah. Don't, there don't is tip evidence. his hat. Okay, yeah, got don't it. tip the chat. Yeah, because we, we, you know, uh, no, you're good. You're good. I just, I, he's probably watching us tonight. Okay. Yeah. We've, we've got close, almost a thousand people here. Okay. Right now, uh, 898. <clears throat> and, and by the way, we're having technical difficulties. So if you've just joined us, I can't see your chat, but know how important your, your questions are, uh, to me. But I just opened up another, um, uh, window here and a question came up uh, from Suji is there a video where children are playing outdoors can be heard the same night do you know anything about that Billy I do it, so that it does exist it does exist it does exist right it does exist okay and hopefully maybe Brian at some point will will see that uh, and be able to break that down as well, Brian, I, I, I got to I'm not going to put you on the spot because I promised you I would never do that. Okay. But you have listened to millions of gunfire uh, audio ta tapes, right? Or at oh, least you've heard it. Uh, okay. Yeah, we've actually recorded, I think it was a total of two million gunshots in the last 40 years. And and you've been vordired in court as an expert uh, in your field. Yes. Uh, okay. So that state, so, federal, military, you name it. Yep. And so, I mean, is there any is there any question that that's gunfire? No. The question I mean, is, I'm, no. Mm -hmm. The question is, um, I don't. Again, as I said at the start of the show, I don't get involved with cases. I get involved right. with data. So, how that relates to your case, I don't know. I mean, it could be very obviously related to the case. But it, is there a question that's gunfire? No. Is there a question that it's likely indoors or an enclosed area? No. Uh, you know, there's a few other factors. We don't know what else is being recorded that may not be uh, part of that recording. For example, is there other street noise that may be coming in that is not part of that? The idea is to separate out all the tracks. In other words, take a mono track and start frequency sweeping it for different uh, different things. For example, if, when you on the playback, you can hear all the hiss. We want to get rid of that first of all. All the the uh, basically ambient noise that you have from a DDR system's low lo-fi recording. So we want to clean that up. Then we want to start looking for any voices and go from there. But um, normally what we would do if we were involved, we would do an acoustical test of a room that we thought might be specific. And then I'm sure that they would uh, obviously after cleanup, swab the ceilings and the inside of the light fixtures, that kind of stuff. And uh, it's pretty hard to get rid of that. You know, so because uh, people don't know where to look, I'm not going to say any more places, but they they forget about stuff. So uh, they, you know, they watch crime scene cleanups on TV to get the bleach out and stuff. That's 
that works a little, but I think Billy was starting to allude to stuff. I was getting a little nervous there, but uh, you don't want to, you don't want to, law, law enforcement has their job to do. You don't want to get in your way. Yeah, but, we don't want to tip them too much. Right? No, but I, I do think, you know, it's so great to have such a group of listeners that is, is into this stuff because again, that is where so much of the, of the help comes from. It's from, it's, I, I call them posses. Basically in Arizona, we call them posses because they, they help, they search, they help They do amazing stuff. Okay. So Billy, I have a question. Let's uh, let, and maybe uh, Brian and, and, you know, weigh in here. So when you were in the house, where is her bedroom? Where's the master bedroom? You, you walk in court, the front from, door, you walk, you walk up the stairs and it's at the top of the stairs, the large uh, master bedroom um, with French doors leading out to a balcony on the outside and a large walk-in closet, uh, large bathroom, but no door on the bathroom, just an open door. So it's, if I had to guess square footage of that house, it's probably 4,000 maybe. It's okay. a big house. And is that, is that bathroom uh, against an exterior wall and where that uh, video surveillance system is? Or I don't is want it to the say other side because the, the, the people, okay. I don't want to identify the people. Okay. But it's got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. So my, I'm thinking if it's 1057 um, and the comforter is missing. 957. Nine, 957. Okay. And the comforter is missing. Um, Maybe she's in bed. Maybe she's, maybe it's an ambush. You know, and if, did they take the mattress? Do we know? I, I don't know. Okay. Just curious. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Uh, one of the other couple, we got a couple of questions coming in here. Um, a lot of people are worried about uh, how's how's the children's situation going with the grandparents. How's that coming along, Billy? I know you you've been helping uh, Mary, Chris, and and Richard extensively, and their and their family. How, how's that coming? Uh, sorry, Chris, I don't <laughs> I don't want to comment on that. We've got okay. we're trying to make sure that's that those good. kids are safe, and that's yeah, that's our goal, right? Me so too. We we yeah. have something in the works right now, um, but. I'm very fearful for those children because of his patterns of behavior of control, limiting access, which is what he did with Maya for a year and a half. Uh, he's now doing it with the children. I'm extremely concerned about those children. So I'm doing the best I can. Um, and I'll hate myself if something happens to those kids. Yeah. So well, I, I, me too. I, 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 I can't even fathom that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm about, you know, ready to jump out of this chair tonight. I mean, and, uh, you know, so I, well, I got to be honest with you, Billy, you are just have been just fantastic. And, uh, you know, I mean, I know that uh, Mary Chris and Richard and the rest of the family is just so grateful. And the community as a whole should be very grateful for the work and the, and, and just the diligence and, and, uh, you know, just the bulldog in you. To, to make to make the aware to make the public aware of all of the situation uh, as it is today, and let's just hope that things move rapidly. Uh, you know, be, now that some of this is in, you know, and for the record, we didn't reveal this information. This is this is sitting out there. Uh, we're just compiling the information, and Brian, uh, you know, who's an expert, and yourself. Uh, in what you do are well, we're just kind of weighing in on it and and just it's an individual opinion uh, for you know individually as us. But what's more importantly, uh, we we have uh, what sounds like you know significant gunfire from inside the house. We know there was a search warrant, and we know on that search warrant they were looking for guns. So, I mean, I'm not a rocket scientist, but there's a direct correlation of probable cause right there. You know, they, they went to a judge and they convinced the judge, hey, your honor, here's why we're looking for guns. And they probably weighed this tape as that probable cause to that, you know, to the, you know, to the affidavit. Okay. And, and took uh, not 
not only guns from Larry's house, but guns from Uncle Ricky's and Aunt Kathy's house. They executed yeah, a search warrant there as well. And, yeah, and Chris, exactly. I just want to say you're always very generous with the compliments, and I appreciate that. Yeah. But every day I talk to you, I learn something from you, man. You are just a wealth of information. And Brian, thank God that you're uh, helping with this case. Um, oh, just, appreciate it. Any way I can help? You, I, yeah. I learned a lot tonight from you. <laughs> yeah, and so let's let me uh, go over here. I've got. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, if you guys haven't subscribed to our channel, please take a moment and hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. You know, that's uh, that's my two minute elevator pitch. I'm trying to hit 15,000. Try to get me to 15,000. OK, and then we'll then we'll shoot it for 20. OK, uh, so let's see. I want to go here. So is there a GoFundMe? Yes, Lisa, there is a GoFundMe uh, and it's under Maya's uh, family. You can just look up uh, Maya Maletti GoFundMe account. You go support that GoFundMe. They need the resources. Uh, they're doing a lot of searching out there. And I know that Richard and Mary Chris have taken off, you know, work for the last three months. Uh, and they're trying to support their family. Uh, go, if you if you have the wherewithal and the resources to do it, go, go help them. Go help them. Uh, let me see if I can find another question here. So, guys, uh, I just the audience, I apologize. I can't see your chat right in front of me for some reason. Uh, my YouTube thing this tonight, I can't see your questions. So I have another tab open. So if you have any questions, go ahead, put them up and uh, I'll go ahead and uh, read it. And Dylan, if you can find the GoFundMe uh, for Maya, just if you can throw that in there. Uh, somewhere into the uh, chat or one of the uh, our mods, Sophia, Miss Sophia, if you could grab that or Tony, we'd uh, or somebody can grab that. That'd be wonderful. So let's see here. Uh, man, oh man, there. What, what gang was Larry in, and where? They're asking. Somebody's asking. Okay. Do we know? Yeah, uh, Asia, Asian insane boys, AIB, AIB, AIB. Yep. Yeah, and that was it. That was an offshoot of the the Bloods. Uh, so they wear red, and uh, I think they got eaten up on the southeast side. And I don't know how. Um, you know, personally, I don't know how um, active they are anymore. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like an AIB. He was a gangbanger uh, when in his younger days, right? Yes, correct. Is that is that what you're learning? Yes. Okay. Okay, what link, uh, Mimi J, uh, Ms. Sophie, what link, uh, the GoFundMe, uh, uh, Ms. Sophie, if you can find it uh, for um, Maya, if we can put that into the chat here. So what else? Uh, uh, let's see here. What, quite, what kind of questions you got for Brian? This guy's a wizard. I'm going to start calling you the wizard, Brian. <laughs> uh, you're, you're like... You know, you're like pulling the sheet open, and there you are sitting there with all the gadgets behind you. You know, uh, they're going to make well, a move. I'm, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. When I first saw Brian's background, I thought it was yeah. one of those computer-generated backgrounds, but that's real equipment behind him. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, we, no, we got lots of we got lots of big machines. So, hey, it, I, yeah. and you've won thirty-nine Emmys. Yeah, I've got 12 Emmy Awards above me, and a lot of it was for doing stuff that, uh, for example, we were the first American camera crew in the tunnels of Kuchi after the Vietnam War. We always went out on a limb to do crazy stuff. I got about 14,700 hours of helicopter time, which was, you know, gave me an advantage point to shoot stuff that, you know, and, and a, a mobility I didn't have. The other thing it gave us is at the time, uh, having a jet helicopter in the 80s was was pretty rare. So we, we helped a lot with law enforcement on search and rescue, body recoveries, um, anything that uh, law enforcement needed a helicopter for, surveillance, because they didn't have helicopters at the time. And because we worked for a television network, we had the uh, wherewithal to you know support a helicopter operation. So it, it helped, you know, not only with the media side, but also obviously with the law enforcement side. And uh, we were literally, literally Lincoln 30 on their band uh, for the different agencies. So um, it was it was a really interesting time. Uh, you know, I learned an awful lot and we did an awful lot, which uh, which was, you know, 
I don't think law enforcement gets enough credit for the stuff they do for a lot of these search and rescues and, and a lot of this stuff. You only hear about the bad stuff. You don't hear about yeah. the good stuff. You know, and thank you for your service. I mean, of, of what you've been doing there, because and tonight's a perfect example uh, of a guy like you weighing in on on this, you know, mother who you've never even met. And, and you've taken your time out to come here and say, hey, you know, here's what I think. And of course, you know, you're, you're going to have to get all the the tapes and everything and you, you would analyze everything. Yeah. And, you know, but the fact that you're here. Uh, that that just speaks volume uh, of your character and who you are. Well, you uh, can never. Uh, I appreciate that, Chris. But you can never yeah. forget that there's a a family involved. Yeah. I mean, we try to isolate ourselves to just the data, but it, you know, and, and that's what we have to do. You kind of have to get jaded to just the data because everything is it'll overwhelm you with. As you know, working homicide, you you get a lot of stuff that's hard to shake. But I, I don't know of an officer that doesn't have, especially a detective, that doesn't have a picture in the wallet of a cold case uh, that is near and dear to them that they want to solve before they done their 20. Uh, and those are those are things that, you know, I love to get involved with cold cases and uh, with active cases. We just try to stay out of the way in law, of the law enforcement unless they need us. Well, that that's magic to my ears because when Billy said, hey, how can I help? I said, well, I can take care of that. So... Uh, I've got your resume and I'll uh, shoot it up to the cold case foundation because uh, we we're, we've got about 300 cases uh, worldwide. You know, right it's, now. it's amazing how many uh, ex detectives want to get involved in that just because they miss it. That, you know, it, it, this yep. is the typical thing. I know so many guys have, you know, done their 20 or done their 25 and they're turning out and, and immediately they're either wanting to get on cold cases or they get their PI license, but you miss the adrenaline and the stress and the bad coffee, you know, the stuff that kept you up at night. Um, you know, I think that, that's something you, you, you could, you could be off for a week and then you go like, I miss this stuff. So, you know, my, my thought is if I don't look forward to getting into the lab every day, then I'm in the wrong business. You know, I'm, I'm up early and I'm in here yeah. late. So to me, this is what I love doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's in our blood, right? It's all yeah. we know. It's kind of like, you know, it's it's all you know, and you, you just kind of do what you've got to do. And then, you know, you find a good family who doesn't have the resources and or, you know, the the immensity of the volume of impact that these that you uh, all of us on this, you know, uh, program here tonight, we get it. I mean, we've been there, done that, and we understand the totality of it. But you get this family, like you said, or families and you know they're they're just grasping for straws and so you know what it it's it's our responsibility i think to give back and yeah. to help if we can help so uh one question so uh billy i'm gonna i'm gonna direct this at you it says uh is it possible she could be over the over the border there are a lot of uh victims that go unidentified down there do you have any information relating to uh, anything that would point you that way So, I'd really rather not comment on that. <laughs> okay. So, okay. I mean, I have because I have to protect sources. Uh, Understood. But that's absolutely something that we're looking at. I mean, this is we have not narrowed it down, eliminated anything at this point. We're and one of the things that you're so good at, Chris, is reaching out and getting these people from the internet who are just really super smart people. Um, and they will come in with ideas and comments and things. And every day, every single day, we get those tips and leads. Um, and I do my best to follow them up. Some are good, some are bad, but that's just the way it goes. That's what I, how I view my job, run down every lead, right? And so that is definitely one of the leads that we're running down. And and I and so, Rel, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I hope that helps your answer. And and if you if anybody does, you know, to that point, to Billy's point, if you have, you know, first of all, if you have firsthand knowledge about something, immediately call Chula Vista Police Department. Just just get on the phone, call nine one one, and say I know whatever you know, and then tell them. 
The second thing is call Billy. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But give, give, give them enough time to do their job, okay? But make sure, you know, you've got plan B. Remember, the space shuttle got to the, you know, uh, out in space because they had five backup systems, okay? And, uh, you know, so rule number one, don't get involved in the investigation. Let them do their thing. They're good at what they do. They know what they're doing, okay? So just kind of send it all to Chula Vista Police Department. Please, please, if you know something, if, if you've heard something, you've seen something, don't be afraid. Nobody is going to hurt you. I can, I can assure you of that. Call, call, give that information. It could be that little piece of a puzzle that, uh, you know, turns an investigation uh, around and then, you know, more things can happen rapidly. They have the resources. They, they have the experience. Uh, they just need the information. Okay? So if you have it, please plug it in. Okay. And, uh, you know, just kind of think through that. Uh, so let me see if I can find another question here. Uh, let's see here. You guys have, uh, okay, does Brian, uh, okay, there's a question here, Brian. Let me see if I can pull it up for you here. Uh, let's see here. Where did it go? It went by pretty quickly. Sorry about that. Not a problem. What was the movie, Brian, about the would you like to play a game? Global nuclear? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, that was uh, the Whopper was the system. I don't remember the name of the uh, uh, the yeah. movie, though. But yeah, would you like to play a game? Exactly. That's what your system looks like to me. It's funny. A lot of attorneys call us the nuclear option because it, they just do. They're like, let's get the nuclear option on this because of the amount of <laughs> horsepower we have for computing. But I think it's kind I, of a funny, funny name. I think I know the answer, but is it's you know? Do you think it's screaming on the tape? And I don't I don't know if where you want to go on that, but that's what that's what folks are are thinking here, Brian. What are your thoughts? I haven't analyzed the original uh, yet, and I know you've sent it to me. Uh, we're always backed up by at least two weeks, uh, mm -hmm. even on a on a weekend we're jamming. So uh, all both labs are slammed at the moment. So. I'll probably be doing the workup in about a week if I can. Uh, and again, it has to be hand manipulated. It can't be, uh, you know, no automatic pro program is going to be able to clean it up the way you can do by hand. It's kind of like painting a house. You can stick a, you know, uh, you can, you know, stick a stick a dynamite and five gallons of paint. That's one way to paint the room. But the best best way to do it is by hand. So with cleaning audio, the best way to do it is always, you know, using the most advanced tools by hand, uh, going through it bit by bit. So we'll be able to narrow down if it's human voices. But the second part of that question is, is that screaming uh, related to what's on the uh, what the actual crime scene? Because you might have kids screaming in a yard or something. So you have to be able sure. to, because it's a mono source, you have to be able to say, uh, okay, here is some screams. Here are some gunshots. Now that's for the police department then to try to, to work with those facts and say, are these related or not? Because very often with an outdoor mic or with a surveillance, you're going to catch whole neighborhoods of activity. So uh, ours is to clean it up as best as possible and provide it to you, uh, uh, you know, to Billy and to you to, to work with. We just give you the tools uh, and then you basically put together the puzzle. So there's another question here, Brian, to dovetail into that. Do you mm -hmm. clean, does Brian's company clear up video, clean up video oh, yeah. as well as audio? Yeah, we, we do everything up in 8K. Everything we work on now is 8K. And a lot of the surveillance stuff, I was just mentioning earlier, we did a case because the artificial intelligence, uh, the software upgrades about twice a week. We use about eight different AI systems. And uh, what you can do now as you, what you could have done a month ago is monumentally different it changes that much so very often on uh, i just did a homicide on thursday where i went back and, and i was able to pick out where the shooter was as opposed to what i what i did earlier i couldn't just because of the advances in software but yeah most of, i really started out doing video because i worked for nbc uh so i was uh, a case i have on upcoming on tuesday i'm taking very old vhs tape i'm transferring it through what's called a time-based corrector 
clarifying that and then pulling individual uh, you know 18 inch photos out of every frame to enhance those to see if they can help solve a, a crime so it, it is about having the best equipment and, and staying up to it uh, up with it and also just having the chops to do it uh, just be doing it every day for 41 years now you basically are always learning at the minute you stop learning but you're dead in the water you're always doing research you always have tons of uh, data you're looking through but video is is very something very often we work with however there's the old thing uh you know uh, you, when you watch a tv show they just hit a button that says enhance it doesn't work that way it depends on how many pixels per inch you have to work with to begin with and is it original or is it a, a generational copy that that makes a huge difference so we always try to get the original uh you know data if possible to work with but yeah we do a lot of that okay so i've got a question here from blue island uh and i uh, thank you for pointing at pointing it out there that by the way so everybody knows again i hate to keep reminding everybody my chat is not working on my computer so i'm over on another screen reading everybody's uh, questions so forgive me tonight guys if uh i miss your question it's not on purpose uh by any by any shape or you know by in, any intent so the question is this it says uh where does larry has family has uh where does larry has family members who work at doj what kind of pull uh would they have uh billy i mean you you've been in that game forever uh on the military side uh, what, what's your opinion on that I've heard, I've heard that um, about the DOJ. I've also heard that about the local police agencies out there in San Diego. Um, I, I would need to see a lot more evidence than what we have now to speculate that somebody would be working for Larry, uh, who's working for DOJ or one of the local police agencies. I, I'm, I'm not there. I'm not there with them. I mean, I, it's a yeah. when you're brainstorming, all these thoughts are good thoughts, um, but that's I'm not there yet. Yeah, I and, and I'll just opine on that as well and just kind of dovetail in your thought process. Uh, it, quite frankly, that could actually be against him uh, because at that point they're leaning on those family members going, what do you know? Uh, or even using them for a different angle uh, to try to get close to him. So I, I don't see it as a conspiracy to protect uh, any family members at all. In fact, it, it could actually be detrimental. And if I was him, I wouldn't talk to him just personally, you know, so. But, <laughs> yeah. but I can tell I can tell you that when people see a mountain of evidence and they see inaction, that's yeah. how these things get started. It's, well, wait a minute, there must be something else going on. Let me try to make sense of this in my head. And one of the way people make sense of it is, oh, it's a conspiracy. So I, the longer we go without action, the more these type of things, questions are going to be asked. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I want to play that uh, tape. I want to play that audio one more time here as we get close to, you know, an hour and a half into this. Um, so let me, let me, let me tear it up here for a second. If you're just joining us tonight, uh, I, I, I want you to know I've got two of the greatest uh, experts in the, in the game here. And uh, Brian, you know, who you see over uh, in the upper right-hand corner, he's got 39 Emmys, guys. Okay? And you can, we're going to put his company down on the bottom. It's usaforensic.com. Uh, and this guy has weighed in on some of the most high-profile uh, cases around the world. And a lot of times you don't know anything about him. He's in the background, Okay until all of a sudden he comes walking in and they put him on the stand and he testifies as an expert on both the defense and the prosecution and, and others for, you know, private companies as well as DOJ, DOD, you name it, he's done it. So with that, let's play the audio, uh, Dylan, uh, and remind everybody why we're here tonight. Tee it up.
Okay, Dale. I, I got to tell you, Billy, every time I hear that, and, and Brian, I, you know, that gap, that, that, you know, from a behavioral aspect, that gap between six and seven, that's a thought process. There's a thought process going on here. And man, I, guys, gals, you know, you're, you're hearing it. And, and you and measure that gap, measure that gap because in that gap, uh, again, you know, I just did a I just did a deal on Susan Smith. Remember her back in the day who rolled her three kids into the water? Okay, I went on the drive, the same the same road the same road she took. Okay, it it took about eighteen minutes to get to the lake. Okay. And I'm here to tell you, when you have that kind of gap, you have somebody who is very specific about their behavior. This is organized. This is an organized offender is what we would call them. Okay. From the behavior science side. Okay. So any other thoughts on that, guys? Billy? I... It's hard for me to not be emotional when I hear it. So I have to, it takes me a second to gather my thoughts when I hear that. It just, every time I hear it, it's the same impact. It's just very emotional. And I feel horrible for the family. And I know that they're listening tonight and I'm sorry. We're doing the best we can. Yeah. I, I, I'm on a mission. Hey, Maya Maletti needs justice. That's it. That's plain and simple. And th that right there, okay, is, is a game changer for me tonight. Okay. This, th something needs to be moving quickly. And, you know, God bless you, Mary, Chris, Richard, the rest of your family. And I apologize, like Billy, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that I have to play this, that tape again for you. I can, I can only imagine what you're feeling. Okay. Actually, I can't. Okay. But what I can say is this. This platform will not cease. This YouTube channel will not cease until the person who is responsible for those sounds is, is brought to justice. And, and, you know, not in the court of public opinion. That's, th this is not the court of public opinion. Okay. That's the, that what you just heard was audio. Okay. That's called evidence. Okay. And that evidence is connected to something. And right now we have a mother missing. And we're into 100 days, right, Billy? That's Almost right. A okay. So keep going. Keep pressing. I'm, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm pressing forward even more tonight than I was last week. Um, that said, Brian, uh, I want to give you the last word. Tell us a little bit about your company. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you you feel uh, you want our audience to know. And I know you have a YouTube channel too, right? Your company? No, uh, I have a private YouTube channel, but I really don't have much up on it except uh, the video that you put on um, uh, and, and just some music that I listen to. And the reason is we stay off of social media. We try to be, uh, I mean, I, I have a LinkedIn set up, but we don't post on social media, on Twitter, or anything like that. We're very, we're very behind the scenes for the most part. So, uh, but what, basically, what we do is we do audio, video, cell phone, photographic, uh, computer analysis for different cases. Our next computer case, uh, well, I think this tomorrow I have a case with the Department of Defense, and one of our next cases is in Monaco right now, is which is uh, it's an issue because of, of COVID. You know, so travel that's overseas right now is, is an issue. But we usually, like I say, have about 200 cases a year that we do, that we accept and that we work on. And like I say, we work, to us, data is data. It takes no side. We just do data. We, uh, uh, we work for, like I say, for prosecution, defense, private parties, a lot of uh, corporations, um, government agencies, just whoever needs high-end boutique data, we do unusual, unusual stuff. 
So uh, again, we you know we're a word of mouth type operation. Usually, people find us because somebody referred us. We don't we long since pulled out all our advertising and stuff just because we're behind the scenes group. We're here to help attorneys. We're here to help people. But uh, again, we're, uh, we're we're the background guys. We provide unbiased data. That's our job. Absolutely. Well, about well, this we're we're grateful you. that you came. Pardon? Yeah, we're grateful that you're here, and oh. and however we can support you, uh, we're gonna put we're gonna put your company's link down at the bottom. Billy, uh, what do you th what do you think? What what do you want to say before we sign out? Don't give up. Don't get tired, people out there. Um, we'll get we'll get this resolved. Don't quit. Don't get discouraged. Yeah, totally thank agree. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Okay, Chris. guys. Thank you both. Yep, no, uh, we appreciate you both as well. And so, guys and gals, if you haven't had a chance, you know, subscribe. But second, but more importantly, okay, more importantly, go to that GoFundMe page for Maya. If you can contribute, please contribute over there. Help her. Help her family, okay? And then second, if you know something, say something. Call Chula Vista Police Department, please, please. They need your, your help, please. Other people have stepped up, and for that, the family is grateful. I know the investigators are grateful, but maybe there's one piece of the puzzle that they need that they need to get, and you may be the answer to that. I am so thankful that you're part of this channel. I cannot tell you enough how grateful we are. And I apologize tonight for some of the technical difficulties, but you know, the, uh, we this is this is about Maya, and the technical stuff will work itself out. Okay, keep pressing forward. Do not give up. Go out on those searches, support the family, give them give them that uh, emotional support that they're looking for, and always remember to be good to each other as well that uh, this too shall pass and justice will be served. Dylan, thank you for everything you do. Thank you for our, to our mods tonight. God bless you. You're the best uh, out there in this, in the YouTube community. And for that, I'm grateful. And, I'm, and hopefully next week, I'll be able to see a lot more taking place. Still, can you take us out, bud? See you next week. Hard working every day, I'm stressed out 24-7, babe, no, no timeouts Wish we could fly away, you and I Go to our favorite place, oh yeah, yeah Make special memories, together I'll be your company, now and forever Facing away